today. Uh, so yesterday we finished the main part of episode 4. And I'd forgotten that there is a very, very significant part that's for whatever reason locked in the tea party. But we need to start that today and then do the second tea party too. I don't think it'll be a super short stream. It's probably not going to be super long. Probably under two hours? I'm not sure, actually. It could be around two hours. It's not like an insignificant tea party by any means. Okay. Yeah, as I remember this part hadn't come up yet. As well. So right now, um, I believe Battler and Maria are the only ones left alive. And Battler is just like, they're in the island with nothing to do. I don't have a clue what's going on. Please, someone explain in a way even I can understand what happened yesterday. I was in the kitchen of the mansion, grabbing some food without permission. If you open up that massive business class refrigerator, you can find anything. You can eat and drink as much as you like. Even if the typhoon didn't clear for a week, I'd have more than enough to eat. With wine in one hand, I was helping myself to some dry cured ham. I wonder just how expensive this wine and ham are. You ingredients are out of luck too. If only you'd had Gota send to cook you, you could have been reborn as much more incredible food. I looked at the clock. Very soon it would be midnight. October 5th, the second day, would end. The insane October 4th, yesterday, seemed like a lie. That's how much. Nothing had happened after that test thing. Nothing happened. No phone call came, and no letters came. No person came, and no one attacked me. Nothing happened at all. I want to start demanding a refund on all the time and energy that tension stole from me. Because after that, for an entire day, a full 24 hours, nothing happened. So surely, nothing's going to happen now. A full 24 hours ago, Beatrice called me to the spot in front of the mansion's entrance. There, I was given a strange test to determine the successor to the headship or whatever. I gave a serious answer in my own way, but it somehow hadn't meshed with the other side. Beatrice got pissed for no reason and fell silent. I yelled at her to try and say something, but she gave no answer. When I asked where Mario was, she just told me to go to the chapel and left. To tell the truth, it was an anticlimax. No matter what kind of weird test you give, at least tell me whether it passed or failed. I tried to say, thanks for coming, the results will be mailed to you later, or something. Quit messing with me. Anyway, I then headed to the chapel. After failing their tests, both Georgianaki and Jessica were killed. I couldn't let Maria get killed too. Also, I might get a chance to catch some person trying to kill her. As a little kid, I often heard from Jessica that you'd get in trouble if you went near the chapel, so I'd never been there, but I at least knew where it was. I couldn't find any trace of a person there, but there was a key bundle lying in front of the door. I thought this might be someone telling me to open the door, but after trying all the keys, I found that none of them fit. also called Maria's name, but there was no answer whatsoever. I searched around the chapel, but there was a limit to what I could do in the pitch black with just a flashlight. I realized that this key bundle might be a set of master keys, which could make it possible to open the door to the mansion. I found no sign of Maria, so I returned to the mansion. The mansion was wrapped in silence, and in a horrible stench. However, it's amazing how good humans are at adapting. The inside of the mansion must still be wrapped up in the smell. However, I grew completely used to it and stopped minding it. It didn't seem any worse than any old house where someone had burnt some meat. At first, I was bewildered by the stench, but I decided to head to the dining hall for the time being. Bad idea. And found those corpses that were so pitiful. Go to center the rest, I'd hesitated to speak to them in detail. They've finally been added. <clears throat> we finally have some corpses here. Come on, honey. Nazi. Yep. Witnesses don't believe she was killed with a gun, funny enough. Well, it's because she was killed with an arrow, I suppose. Yep. It was the mains about Natsui and the others who'd become the first victims. Half of each head had been completely spilled open. And it was so gruesome that even without knowing a thing about examining corpses, I could say that they were 100% dead. And on top of that, the remaining halves of their faces were left like normal, so it was even easy to identify them. Really convenient corpses these were. And in addition to those six bodies, was one more. The seventh corpse was Maria. Oh. She lay next to Aunt Rosa, as though sleeping alongside her. I cried. At the death of an innocent young girl. And at the cruel way my dad and the rest had died. I raced through the mansion, swinging the hat stand spear, yelling, Come out, you bastard! But I couldn't find any trace of anyone else. Thinking they might be planning to hide someone attacking me from behind, I went around searching for hiding places, sometimes growing more cautious, and sometimes intentionally letting my guard down in various ways, but in the end, not even a kitten appeared. 
Assumed she was killed by some kind of poison. The most peaceful form of invitation to the gold land. <clears throat> then morning came. My attention and fatigue, combined with my drowsiness, making for the worst kind of dawn. Humans are pretty incredible. Even when a murderer might have been hiding somewhere, we prioritize drowsiness and fatigue over our own lives. I have a cat here in my mouth. Okay, I think I got it. You. By that time, I was starting to feel pretty ridiculous. After all, for a full six hours before dawn, I had walked around the mansion, yelling at the culprits to show themselves. My search had been a careful one, and I'd tire myself out and let my guard down. Even so, no one came to attack me. Basically, I lost patience with them and figured they could do whatever the hell they wanted. The boat won't come until the typhoon passes. They said on TV that it won't pass until tomorrow, so I've got another full day today. Losing Bat lost its interest, and even though I knew it would probably make the police mad, I decided to play detective a bit. Nothing to lose. First was the dining hall, where the very first murder had occurred. You guys not close trouble? Cats. The six who had been killed in the beginning really were pitiful. The weapon used was probably a gun. Maybe their heads were split by something powerful, like a magnum bullet or a shotgun. It was a reasonable theory to hold. Compared to that, the seventh corpse, Maria, had died in a much better and cleaner way. At a glance, I could see no external wounds and didn't understand how she'd been killed. But by her mouth were traces of bubbles that she might have spat out, and it looked like a typical death by poisoning that you might see in a TV drama. Wasn't Maria called out to the chapel and given a test? So why was she in the corpse-filled dining hall, lying to her mother? Lying this to her mother, dead. Even if the cause of death was poison, who gave it to her? Her clothes weren't disturbed at all. It's hard to imagine that she was forcibly pushed down and given an injection of poison. And it's probably better to assume that she was given a capsule of poison or something and made to swallow it. Candy. But compared to the scattered and violently mutilated corpses in this room, Moya's corpse was too clean. If they had a gun, they only needed to pull the trigger. But poisoning, whether by having her drink it or by an injection, would take a lot more effort. Considering the culprit's brutal nature, you'd think Mario's death alone was given special treatment. Why was only Mario given a sleep like death? True, being killed is always a pitiful thing, but for some reason, Mario's death alone seemed very courteous to me. Both of Mario's hands were joined on a chest, as though the dead person put them there herself. Did Mario do that herself before dying? Isn't this usually something done by someone else after the person dies? As I was sleeping with her mother, whose head was half crushed, Mario dozed in peace. For some reason, that contrast really bugged me. Including the direct cause, it's really safe to say that Mario's death is shrouded in mystery. And more than anything else, the biggest mystery of this dining hall was the pitfalls. The pitfalls that both Uncle Krause's group and Goda's sons had mentioned. After the first six were killed, five more fell through pitfalls and were captured. What are pitfalls? Those things that suddenly open and you fall through them, right? The room had a solid floor with a carpet that looked dignified, if a bit worn out. No matter how you looked at it, it was a single piece. If a pitfall had opened up, there would have to be a seam just in that place. And, if there had been some trick like a pitfall, wouldn't it creak when you walked on it? No matter how much I walked around, feeling the carpet, I just couldn't imagine that a pitfall was hidden here. Anyway, it'd be one thing if a single person fell, but a whole five people did. By putting together everyone's stories, each one of them had fallen from a different location. So at the very least, there had to be five separate places with pitfalls. So what does this mean? Was this room actually made with pitfalls across the entire floor? So by pushing a button, you could open a pit up a pitfall in the location of your choice? Some kind of contraption like that? That kind of ridiculous mechanism would be surprising even in an ninja mansion. But I wouldn't put it past Grandpa. But if Dad and the rest had heard about this, I wonder if they'd say, I wouldn't put it past Grandfather to do it to make it. <laughs> at any rate, I didn't learn anything more from the dining hall. Do the pitfalls not exist? Well, they exist, but I just can't find them, amateur that I am. I can't say for sure. Since they claimed that the pitfalls were there, I can't ignore them, even if I can't find them. The next ones to be killed were Jessica and George Anarchy. I discovered George Anarchy when I'd been called out for my test. He had been called out to the arbor in the Rose Garden, and probably shot in the forehead with a gun. Jessica had been called to her own room on the second floor of the mansion. The door to her own room was locked. That wasn't a problem at all, since I had a master key. Inside the room, it was horrible. But after the dining hall, I was used to corpses, so I had built up a bit of an immunity. This must be really hard. I don't know what I'd do in this kind of situation. 
left them out on an island, on an island with corpses of like nearly 20 family members and friends that I knew. Well, servants, not really friends, but acquaintances. The phone receiver was loose and dangling. She'd been killed while still on the phone with me. Jessica was leaning against the wall right next to it, with half of her head split open. As far as I could tell by glancing at the scene, it looked as though she'd been killed while on the phone. In that case, had the culprit been right there before her eyes? I hadn't gotten an impression of listening to Jessica's voice over the phone. I'm pretty sure Jessica said, they got me. It's probably best to assume that she'd already received a fatal wound at the time of the phone call. That's right. And she also said this. When you come, Battler, I'll be a corpse with half its head split open. Yes, that's what she said. From what I could tell by looking at Jessica's corpse, there were no wounds on her other than the damage to her head. Could she have had an injury serious enough to make her prepared for death and then died halfway through the phone call? But the way that she but the way she talked on the phone made me think that she'd escaped harm for the time being. You shouldn't be able to have a casual conversation over the phone if the culprit's right before your eyes. So did the culprit come in partway through the phone call and kill Jessica? No, that can't be right. After all, this room was locked. Wait, that doesn't tell me anything. If the culprit stole a master key from one of the victims, locking the door would be meaningless. But she had no external wounds other than her head. In the case, should I assume that the fatal wound she was prepared to die from and the actual external wound that damaged her head were two different things? And that both of them were made to the same part of the body? In other words, Jessica was struck severely to the head and received an incredibly bad wound. Then she called me and either lost consciousness or died while on the phone. Then the culprit came and damaged her head again, something like that. It makes sense because like if you have, have your head's like totally caved in and missing, you're not going to be on the phone. After being called to this room, Jessica was attacked by the culprit and received a serious injury. Then the culprit thought she'd been killed and went away for the time being. But Jessica miraculously started breathing again and called me with what would become her dying message. Then the culprit realized that they'd failed to kill her and rushed back to deliver the final blow after Jessica fell unconscious from massive blood loss. That seems to add up, more or less. Except for how Jessica was able to accurately predict the nature of that final blow. And there was one more thing that bugged me about the phone call from Jessica. Jessica had said this. Georgie sounds done for it too. That was an instant death. She said it almost as though she'd witnessed Georgianaki being killed. But while well, you certainly could see the rose garden from the window of Jessica's room, you could even see the roof of the arbor where George Anakin had been summoned, it was very far away. Out on the fact that it was the night of a typhoon, and it's very hard to imagine that she was able to witness everything that happened by the arbor from this window. And more than anything else, Jessica left before George Anakin, though she shouldn't have known that George Anakin's test took place by the arbor. Why did Jessica know that George Anakin had been killed? That yeah, is suspicious. Also, during my search of the entire mansion, I found Kiria San's corpse as well. It was in one of the old guest rooms at the back of the first floor. <clears throat> yeah, well, I don't know. How much does blood dry, like, how quickly? Because it's already the next day. He said it's almost midnight already. It's been almost 24 hours, right? So, I don't, I don't know. Especially with, like, no medical knowledge, like he said. I don't know how much he could really tell from that, personally. In the past, before the construction of the guest house, the relatives had spent the night in the east. The Asan's situation matched Jessica's perfectly. She'd probably been killed during a phone call with me. The receiver was hanging on tightly, and Kitty Asan lay crumpled in that corner. But the way she'd been killed was very different from Jessica. Her head wasn't smashed. Instead, a stake with an occult design was buried into her forehead. It was so gruesome. So I pulled it out. That's a bad idea, Battler. After pulling it, I realized that this might get me into trouble with the police later. So, a little too late, I set it down by Kidia Sound's side. Its tip was sharp and stained with enough blood that it must have penetrated fully to the brain. I didn't know what kind of metal it was made of, but it was about as heavy as a paperweight. Certainly, if you were all if you were stabbed all out with something like this, it might cause a terrible wound. I probably knew what that stake meant. It's one of those. Style of killing from the fourth toilet onwards of the witch's epitaph. It's probably that gouge with a stake and kill thing. However, human skull is very firm. No matter how much someone muster their strength, could it really have been pierced so neatly? No. By my reasoning, the stake wasn't the cause of death, but had just been used to damage the corpse after death. She's probably killed with a gun or something, like George Anarchy, and the stake had been stuck into the hole left by the gun. Thinking of it that way makes it easier to accept. But was Kiryasan really killed with a gun? And she said on the phone, even though she was holed up inside a locked room, Kiryasan was being attacked. In fact, this room had been locked. Also, she mentioned a golden thread or something falling in and attacking her. In fact, there were four places around Kiryasan's corpse with holes that could have 
been caused by some kind of attack. But a golden thread attacked her through the keyhole? The thing is, if it were a gunshot, wouldn't Valor have heard it? I forget if there was a sound on the phone or not. I looked at the door from Kitty Sound's perspective. If it had been one of those old keyholes you see in old mystery movies, where you can peek into the other side, then it would have clearly been possible to stick something through it. But even through the doors in this mansion world, even though the doors in this mansion world fashioned, the locks were the familiar, average cylinder style that you could find in any normal house. In other words, they weren't constructed in a way that would let you penetrate through them. So no matter how thin an object you might try to stick through the keyhole, it's unthinkable that something penetrated through from the outside and attacked. A cylinder lock. And a keyhole. But despite that, Kiryu-san definitely said that something like a golden thread had flown in through the keyhole. Spun around while aiming for, and attacked her. A golden thread attacking through a keyhole. I couldn't understand what it meant at all. But even so, Kiryu-san probably predicted that I wouldn't be able to understand all this. And it wasn't just Kiryu-san. Jessica said it over the phone too. No, since the very beginning, from the time we talked with Goto-san and Kumisawa-san and got the phone call from Uncle Krause's group, everyone has said the same consistent thing. Grandfather summoned witches and demons, and is killing people with magic. They had been shown that right before their eyes. These weren't tricks or fakes. There was no choice but to believe it. With one voice, they had all said that. That was one of the only ones who hasn't seen something like that with his own eyes. When the mystery woman calling herself Beatrice appeared, even I had pretty much believed that she was a real witch and might start summoning goat monsters right and left. However, after being left alone for a whole day, my feeling of tension had faded completely. I was now, now able to think that something so stupid definitely couldn't be true. Did they lose their heads a little in an extraordinary situation where their lives were exposed to danger? And mistakenly think that a witch was attacking them with magic? But multiple people gave the same kind of testimony, and on top of that, none of their opinions conflicted each other. If it had just been a single statement, I'd be able to suspect that they didn't see what they thought they saw. But doing that now is pretty difficult. I think like... What kind of scenario could lead to this happening? Everyone giving this kind of testimony. Then, right next to the back door, I found Uncle Krauss with his head half smashed. Even though he'd escaped the dungeon of Kuwadorian, and somehow made it this far by a secret underground passage, he'd been killed. Buried into the gruesome cross section of his half-crushed head was a stake with an occult design, like the one that had been buried in Kitty Asan's forehead. In this situation, it was very hard to imagine that the stake was the weapon used. He had been killed with a powerful gun like the six in the dining hall, and after death, had been jabbed with a stake like Kitty Asan. I wonder if the golden threads that Kitty Asan spoke of attacked Uncle Krauss too. Does there exist some kind of tool, like an endoscope, It's very thin, but can be moved about at will? And it can also attack people? No way, I've never heard of anything like that. Definitely not in 1986. But even so... No. But even so, if this fact had been revealed to one of the relatives, maybe they'd say, I wouldn't put it past grandfather to make it. Since I can't deny the existence of Golden Thread X that can be moved at will and attack people, I can either accept that this mystery... That this mysterious weapon exists, or else, I'll have to accept that this was a murder committed with magic. To find the net's corpse, I had to go out through the back door and search around outside of it. I mean, are we just discounting the possibility that people were killed elsewhere in broad places? I guess in Kitty, in this case, uh, she was on the phone. So, that wouldn't work. But for Kraus, you know, he's been killed anywhere in broad anywhere. I mean, we saw him get killed outside, after all. Uh, at the well. I think. Yeah, I believe everyone except Kitty was killed out, out at the well. Before they could get in the house. By the mansion, in the wild grown bushes that were almost swallowed up by the forest, there was something like a, an old well. Right next to it were Dr. Nanjo and Shanna Chan's corpses. Both corpses had their heads smashed. Well. I mean, he's searching everywhere he can for stuff. If there's a gun, he'll probably find it. But it's not like they're gonna leave the gun next to the corpses. Um, to check Kinder's collection, that would presumably be in his room, maybe, with, like, his books and his alcohol. And I... Don't the master keys not work on that? Are there, like, special keys for Kinzo's study? I'm actually not sure. I think there are. I think there were two keys or something, right? Like, Kinzo had one and Genji had one, maybe? I can't remember. I know it came up in a previous episode, though. So, theoretically, he probably can't get into Kinzo's study. 
And, though they weren't stuck in, there were stakes lying right next to each damaged head. Each corpse was atrocious, but having to look directly at Shen and Shen's lovely face, which had been half blown away, was very painful. Then, there was the well. I'd heard that inside it was a secret underground passage to the mysterious mansion, Quadorian. By this time, I'd begun to think that Beatrice and her accomplices might have used this underground passage. Okay, I thought so. And left for Quadorian. Even though there had apparently been at least ten of them, I hadn't seen a trace of anyone. Yeah, you can get it from Genji. If, if it's still on his body, that is, it could have been taken. Um, I mean, he saw Genji's corpse in the, uh, in the dining hall, but he didn't really, like, examine their, you know, the pockets or anything. He just looked at the cause of death. So we got most of them written down now. Uh, we haven't seen Cannon. Where did Cannon die again? Cannon's dead, right? Has Cannon died? I mean, these two hung up at the garden shed. Kinzo, well, we saw him catch fire. What, what happened to Cannon again? Cannon fell down the well. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. So he got shot and got knocked down the well, too. Well, not two. I guess it was just him that did. Either way. Uh, during the escape from the well. It seemed very likely that they'd already escaped to a different location. There's the typhoon. They can't go out to sea. It goes the same for the forest. There's no way they could traverse such a deep, uncultivated forest on foot. In that case, they had only one place to go. The mysterious hidden mansion, Kodorian. Though the secret underground passage at the bot through I can't read today. Through the secret underground passage at the bottom of the well. By this time, I'd entirely lost my fear of being killed if I happened across the enemy. Don't fuck with me. This time I'll storm into your mansion. Uh, wh what the hell? Damn it! The old well had a firm cover on it. The cover was an iron grill. The gaps between the barns were perhaps 20 centimeters across. You could peer inside, but it really wasn't something a human could pass through. If I hadn't known better, I wouldn't have thought it anything more than a simple cover to prevent falls. But from what Kideya Sana told me, I knew that its purpose was to prevent intruders from entering the secret underground passage in its depths. Can we show the CG? Uh, no, but yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead since it's relevant right now. Thank you. Oh, I see. So that, that's a well. I thought it was a window. I see what you mean. Yep. Let me download real quick. So here's the Nanjo and Shannon Corpse Discovery CG here. So you can see this like, uh, it's not like a round like stone well with like the little roof above it or anything like that. It's like an actual like just well in the floor essentially. It's more like a storm drain if anything. Interesting. Hmm. Uh, is there any other CG that's really worth showing off? Uh, none of this other stuff is relevant to what's going on so I'm not going to bother. Okay. Let me finish this. I'd already had most of my coffee beforehand. But I do have another one. I want it. <clears throat> well, the cover was extremely firm and rigid, and no matter how much I pushed or pulled, I couldn't even get close to opening. I couldn't find any obvious lock. It might be sealed by some mechanism. No matter how much I investigated it, I couldn't find anything to really sit. The biggest piece of the information Kira Sana tried to give me, in gambling her final moments, was the underground passage in this well. I don't think I'll be stopped by something like this cover. I'll smash it to bits. I'll search for a tool. I had an idea. After all, I'd seen the various tools in the gardening shed when we'd walk to Sana and Kusawa in there. But the shutter to the gardening shed was locked. On top of that, the key was with Godasan, who was dead on the inside. Right, they gave them the key, so they were going to get it back out. Right, that's who had it. In other words, this guarding shed was a closed room. There's no way to open it from the outside. In that case, I've got to break the shutter. There has to be a tool for that somewhere. And it feels like I'm going in circles here. You've had that happen before. Like six room closed room circle. Then, while searching for that, I learned that the sort of, this, sort of this, the stench <coughs> that had permeated the mansion this whole time was the underground boiler room. The boiler room was dimly lit, humid, smelled horrible, and on top of that was incredibly creepy. But there were several large tools there, and I managed to find a fire axe and some massive wire cutters. And, grandfather's corpse. Now, strictly speaking, I should probably say that I found a burnt corpse of a person who was probably grandfather. Some of his corpse had been stuffed into the blazing fires of the boiler. Dust to dust, ashes, yeah, shit, the dead to the dead. Ginzo always just gets burnt. 
poor guy. It's just his fate. However, by coincidence, I was able to notice the number of toes in the corpse. Both feet had six toes. That's right. I think I heard it from Dad sometime long ago. Something a grand something about grandfather having polydactyly with extra toes. According to old Ushimiro family tradition, it seems that those with extra fingers or toes had some kind of good fortune were treated as a good omen. Yeah, that's what Canada used. I, I I couldn't remember what he used the other day. You're right. <coughs> and because of that, grandfather was selected to be the successors. Oh, I know what I'm thinking. It was um Monday night I was watching Fatal play through episode two in the the Chaos Discord. Yeah. They they finally got to the scene where Ganon brings out his sword for the first time and everyone's like, Why didn't you use that before? <laughs> I couldn't remember what he used, but yeah, it's the fire axe. But I wonder if I can be certain that this is grandfather's body, just from the number of toes. After all, grandfather was supposed to be the leader of the group of culprits. I don't have a clue why he'd get stuffed into a boiler in a place like this and die. A mysterious corpse, burning and spitting out a terrible stench amid the flames. If it really was grandfather, did that mean the leader of the group of culprits wasn't grandfather, but that Beatrice after all? Grandfather was used because it was convenient, and was then thrown away? Unfortunately, it didn't look like it'd be given a chance to hear grandfather's side of the story. Yeah, he fell into the lava. Now that I'd obtained a tool, I thought about rushing to take on the cover to the well. But I decided to break the shutter to the gardening shed first. I had plenty of time to kill anyway. I figured I should check on the condition of Goto-san's and Kumasawa-san's corpses. Some of the least gruesome ones. Lucky you. I hit the shutter with the axe, breaking into it. Stuck the wire cutter into the crack, and scissored it around, opening up a hole. <coughs> then, I faced Goto-san and Kumasawa-san's corpses once more. As a result, I learned a new fact. First, they had not died by being hung by the neck. Both of their feet were solidly on the floor, and both their foreheads were signs that they'd been shot with a gun. The loop seemed longer than a normal noose. On top of that, the length was different on each to match the height of each person. In other words, the lengths had been adjusted so that both Goda-san, who was tall, and Kumisawa-san, who was short, had their feet solidly but barely on the ground. So, it was made to look like they were hanging if you looked through the window, but they weren't really hanging. Again, try to think about what kind of situation could possibly lead to this happening. That's that's really weird. Is it just something like the culprit set up to like make Valor think they were dead before? Were they dead before? I didn't notice a gunshot wound, but it was dark. There's a lot of different interpretations. <clears throat> Obviously, real, you're not allowed to make guesses. <laughs> because you already know. So you shut up. Also, while the ropes carried both of the weights as their heads lulled, both of them had some slack below their knees. This meant that if they'd stood up with those loops around the necks, they would have been some extra length. In other words, these loops wouldn't have been that great for hanging people. The direct cause of death was probably a shot to the head. It was gruesome. Their insides were still dripping out from those gaping holes, staining their faces a deep red. It's really best to assume that they were then hung, pulled up, and left exposed like that. If they'd been shot with a gun, they would probably have been lying down on the floor. If that had been the case, you wouldn't have been able to tell that they were dead even if you peeked through the window. <coughs> The mountain of stuff would have gotten in the way, so if they'd been lying down, they would have been hidden. To make the deaths of those of these two known to the rest of us who couldn't get inside, they would have had to hang them like this, making it visible from the outside. There you go. That makes sense, I guess. Was this done to get back at us for thinking that these two would surely be safe if we left the key with them? I wonder what the shutter key we gave go to son, which should have been sure their safety, is now. That key was in the pocket of his trousers. The gardening shed key had been kindly left there, and even the plate was attached. In other words, the gardening shed had been a closed room after all. And that gave rise to another question. Because this can't be explained by a hanging. If they didn't commit suicide, then these nooses were set up by the culprit. It might have been possible to shoot them through the window, but it's really unthinkable that someone could have tied two loops to the beam from the outside. And furthermore, there was no way they could have lifted up the heavy corpses. In other words, to do all this, they would have had to go inside. But the key was in Godison's pocket, and that shutter had been locked. In other words, the gardening shed had been a closed room. Yoda-san had said that there was only one key to the shutter. But is it possible that there was a copy, and that the culprit was in possession of it? Yeah, we need to see that stuff in red. We'll get there. If we're allowed to theorize that there was actually duplicated, a duplicate of the gardening storehouse key, and that Yoda-san just didn't know about it, then this isn't even close to a closed room. But why is it that, despite the fact that almost all the other corpses were shot to death, and left almost completely alone, just these two corpses were intentionally hoisted up? I couldn't help but feel something a bit odd about that. 
After this, if we assume that the mystery corpse in the boil was grandfather's, the deaths of 16 people have been confirmed. There were 18 people on this island. I'm here, and there are 16 corpses. Gun and Gun's corpse is the only one I, I've been able to confirm. And I did it. <laughs> nah, we saw him die earlier. I was just gonna find him. According to KDSM, he had been killed while climbing out of the well, and fallen down into it. So, with the well closed up like this, it's impossible to check. I tried shining a flashlight through the bars, down into the darkness, in the depths of the well. But it seemed that the jet black darkness out and had no intention of showing me its depths with the light of that level. It looked like I'd have to break the bars after all. Using the axes and things I dragged from the boiler room in the gardening shed, I tried breaking the cover of the well. But the metal bars were extraordinarily sturdy, and breaking them wasn't easy. I then with the axe over and over, until my hands started feeling weird, and eventually gave up on breaking them. It's impossible. If they were at least wood, I might have been able to break them. This metal... That's right, there's no way you can slice through metal bars like butter with a human strength. And I can't seem to begin to understand. That story about how cannon couldn't cut through metal bars. I heard that a light like a red laser beam grew out of his arm. He had like a- he had a welding torch. <laughs> on his arm. <laughs> and then he sliced through the metal bars like he was cutting through butter. Cutting through metal bars like butter? And what's with the red laser beam? Does that mean he secretly had a burner on him or something? And used that to burn through the bars? Still, just what kind of laser could cut through metal bars like butter? It almost sounds like the kind of laser beam you'd find if there was robot anime at all as a kid, doesn't it? Does something like that actually exist? And how did Ken could get that laser beam? No matter how much I want to ask him, he's already been killed. Plus, even his corpse is now in the depths of the well, beyond this cover. If Cannon could, could, Cannon could, could slice through metal bars, I'm sure he could handle this metal cover in a single swing. It feels just like the closed room go to San was locked in while holding the key. Only one person can open the door, but they're locked inside. If only I had that power of cannon guns, I'd be able to do something about this cover myself. Finally. Just who is cannon gun? He couldn't really be a non-human being capable of using a strange power, right? Kidia san told me to believe in witches, and I even met an insane woman calling herself one. But can it couldn't possibly be a human on the witch's side? Or else, the culprit? What the heck? Am I going to start treating him like the culprit, just because I can't find his corpse? Would have been hard for him to kill people, like the people up on the surface while he was with the well group, though. Oh, treating him like the culprit because there's no corpse? And who is the one babbling about the suspicious being innocent? Very well. I can bear having you push all the crimes in canon and building a human culprit theory that way. I will guarantee it with a red. Cannon is dead. Among the five people in Kitty's group, he was the first to die. In short, he was the ninth victim. Thanks, Beatrice. Here we go. Everyone except Battler is dead. That was definitely anti-mystery. <laughs> Since there's no corpse, I can't say for sure that Cannon Gun is dead. So my whispering in red does not reach reach the PCU. But if it did, but it did reach you, right? Meta Battler. Not us. Meta Battler. At a glance, this was a mass murder due to something strange that could only be thought of as magic. Golden threads that attacked their keyholes. No, we even have testimony that something gold flew around the dining hall when the first six died. The two might have been the same weapon. Then there was the closed room murder at the garden shed, and the laser beam that could cut metal bars. And that wasn't all. It was much, much more, like the group of goat monsters, the story of a witch who could create pit poles just by snapping her fingers, the rabbit-like demons who had fired golden threads. I think there was more, but each part was all screwed up. They couldn't possibly accept it, and was forced to suspect that it was some kind of trick or mistake. But why in the world had everyone spoken with one voice, saying the same thing without contradictions in their testimony? It's not only the magic. It's Mario's mysterious death. Why Jessica knew that Dorjanik had been killed? The mysterious burnt corpse that I couldn't confirm really belonged to that damn geezer. And more and more. Very strange circumstances. All stuff I don't get. I tilted the wine bottle up and gulped. I don't have a clue what's going on. After dinner last night, the kids were chased out and told to go back to the guest house. And then there was a massacre in the dining hall. Gideon San and the rest were dropped through pitfalls and captured. Then Jessica and George Anaki were called out to take a test or whatever and killed. Either Gideon San's group was able to escape the dungeon somehow, all of them got killed in the end. Yep. Yeah, you, you can assume that. Yeah, you can assume that's the case, but... 
here's the thing. Like, let's let's talk about like the the garden storehouse with Kumasawa and Gota. <clears throat> let's say they pass the key out. Remember, it can only be opened from the outside, not the inside. Um. So essentially, like if, if they were let in, if this theoretical culprit was let in, and shot them and hung them, then they went outside, closed the shutter, and locked it. How did they get the key back in the goat's pocket? Is the question. That's the only contradiction there, really. But yeah, in some other cases, maybe you could assume that someone just let someone in, for sure. In short, I did nothing except stay locked up in the guest house. During that time, a huge incident occurred and ended. I mean, in the first place, um, with master keys around, like, there, there's a set for each servant, right? Like, Kitie's room and Jessica's room aren't really locked rooms to begin with. They're not closed rooms, I don't think. I don't think it's really... I don't think he even said that he were. If he did, he's under the wrong impression. You, don't bite me. Get out. <clears throat> During that time, a huge incident occurred and ended. What can I call it except incomprehensible? I don't have a clue anymore. Now I'm nothing but a drunk. You plan on leaving only me alive? Show yourself right away and come to kill me already. It's too much of a pain, so I won't search for you. You show me your true form yourself. I won't run or hide, so come at me with arrows or bolts or whatever. From this moment on, Battler is officially drunk. He's not even of age, I don't think. I haven't gotten any sleep since yesterday, so I'm incredibly sleepy. You want to kill me? Go ahead. I decided to return to the guest house and boldly rest in a bed. When I headed to the kitchen and passed through the lobby, that portrait of the witch came into view. The big clock did too. It was almost exactly midnight. Then, the sound of the bell rang out, proclaiming that midnight had arrived. As I listened, I looked up at Beatrice's portrait. Exactly 24 hours ago, I met you. What were you trying to say? And where did you go? It's two in the world, are you? Golden Witch Beatrice. I haven't solved a single one of the riddles surrounding you. Show yourself, and fight me. There will be a fight. <clears throat> then the witch showed herself. Like a guest of honor finally appearing, she showed herself on the landing at the top of the big staircase. So you finally show yourself. I've been kept bored for a whole day. Correct. I give you a whole day. Was that enough for you to fully exercise the rights of the human side? Yeah. I was bored after all. I did a heck of a lot of it. Angie was a good piece. Don't you speak Angie's name. She appeared through a miracle, sacrificed herself, and gave you the tenacity required for certain victory. Don't you speak Angie's name. That brutal death was something you needed. If you hadn't seen that death, you wouldn't have grown serious. Oh. oh no, there's something. I assume you just got enough points. MetaMatPat. Is the intention that I put this face on MatPat? I, I I hope I hope that's your intention. Because that's that, that's what I'm doing. I told you not to speak Angie's name. <clears throat> In short, she was a necessary sacrifice. Otherwise, an anger great enough to kill me would not have been born in you. The rivalry between us cannot be destroyed. Damn you, Lady Burn Castell. It's more fitting to call that a trump card than a piece. No matter how much a piece acts, it does not stray from the board. But no matter how much a power trump card wields, it is always thrown away after it's used. It will get. Made it in time for the good stuff. Andrew was truly a trump good trump card for you. Don't you speak Angie's name. As Hep Battler's angry door, they had to finally stop talking. You know, I don't have time to, to play around in a place like this anymore. Even a tie will keep Angie waiting. So I'll break through you, take my family, and go back home. I won't waste a second playing which games with you. In that case, what should you do? You know, don't you? Yeah. I'll beat you down. I'll blast away all witches, magic illusions, and delusions. Come on, let's get started. I won't want you to trick me again. Resume the game, okay? I'll tear apart the witch's veil, concealing the outright lie you are. You talk too much. All you have to do is honestly say, I'll kill you. Yeah. If those are the words you want, I'll say them. This is the first and last wish of yours that I'll lend in here too. I thank you. I'll... I'll kill you. <laughs> Big text. 
Genzo is the killer with the episode of saying it's possible that they don't put shot up for him and Genzo explicitly knows how to use guns. Well, yeah. Um, yes, he said there were wounds on their heads. <clears throat> I believe they were shot in the head, he said. Yep, assumed that he was hung by the neck after being shot in the forehead. But that still doesn't answer how the key got back in Goda's pocket. Yoroshi, let us begin, battler. Yes, the time for the witch hunt has begun. Try and chase me. Try and corner me. Try and kill me. I expect a lot from you. Try and show me what your little sister gave you in her last moments. Bring it on. Battle's cry burned the world with a white light. And if you opened your eyes amidst the darkness, the two of them could be seen in a rose garden. Here we are. It's time for the big showdown. That caps off the first half of Umineko. <laughs> did he check to see if it was still up? Yes, he did, because he had to break through it. Yep. I assume that means that he checked to see if it was locked. I, I, I'm assuming he's smart enough to try it first, right? Surely. Who shall make the first move? Me. Of old. In the rose garden, beautiful rose petals danced. The color of those rose petals was red. Did the fact that they faced each other in this beautiful rose garden prove or make claim to a red single truth? That must be why the roses are red. But in the language of flowers, roses represent passion, not truth. The flower for truth is a forget-me-not, and that flower is blue. I'll bore through everything with my blue truth. From the very beginning of everything, I'll start from the very first game. We're going all the way back here. This is going to be a big deduction scene that covers the first half of Umineko. <clears throat> so... Pay close attention. That we're, that was gonna provide theories. Game theories. Come. Here I go. I've already proclaimed it, but I'll say it again. This isn't just for the murder of Dr. Nanjo in the last game. Yeah, that's true. I mean, you don't usually need a key to lock a door, unless it's from the outside. <clears throat> This will tear apart every scene from every game since the beginning. Ishimi Kinzo is already dead, so the true number of people on the island is 17. By adding in an unknown person X, that makes 18 people. By supposing the existence of this person X, the crime is possible even if all 17 people have alibis. By this, even though the number of people reaches 18, it's all possible for culprit X to exist and carry out crimes, even if all 18 people seem to have alibis. This is his big theory here. You can break through all the murders in episode 1 by supposing an unknown person X. Furthermore, it's even possible to explain the mystery of Kinzo's evaporation from the closed room sealed by the receipt by making the bold assumption that Kinzo wasn't there in the first place. Unless Biato counters this for the red truth, the illusion of the witch from episode 1 has been completely smashed. This blue truth is valid. The wedge of blue truth that Ballard thrown stabbed right at the top of Biato's left foot. And was the red blood pouring out from there? A protest being made by red truth? Beatha shot one of her eyes tight, enduring the unbearable pain of the blue truth that denied her. Hmm, not bad. But I mustn't be denied yet. I must be killed yet. This is not yet enough. In the subsequent games, there were mysteries that couldn't be explained with it alone, right? Which mysteries? <clears throat> in the final stages of, this, of the second game, George took Goto and Shannon with him, barricaded them in Natsui's room, and was killed. The key that unlocked Natsui's room was locked up inside the room, and all the remaining keys that could unlock the door were in Rosa's hand. Even if a culprit adds existed, it should have been impossible to construct that closed room. I'm trying to remember like this this exact situation. Second thing. I think this was the scene where Shannon was like protecting George with like her big barrier shields. I think it's that scene. Gota died early and then they survived for a while and Beatrice had to like get into the room or whatever. And I think the stakes were like bouncing off the shield or something like that. Something like that. Um Yes, yeah, so far master keys have not been tallied or said in red in this game. I think just in game two, right? Or three. The blue wedge that Pierce Beatle shook. She was resisting, fighting to pull it out. <coughs> No, that doesn't shake my blue truth. If culprits were to obtain a master key, that's not even close to a closed room. No, it was impossible for the culprit to obtain one. All of the master keys are under Rosa's control. 
but that's meaningless if Aunt Rosa was the culprit. Aunt Rosa handed a key over to Culprit X by some method, assisting in the closed room murder. And after that, she retrieved the key by a similar method. Too naive, Pieto. I'd already guessed that much at the time. Yes, you did, didn't you? He doesn't care who he has to accuse anymore as long as he can deny Beatrice. Why? The heck? The wedge that had been gradually losing its sparkle when it seemed as though it was about to be pulled out regained its strong glue again thanks to Batwars' additional glue truth and dug into Beato again, eating its work foot. <clears throat> Just to clarify something. Just because a blue truth gets by and doesn't get disproved by red doesn't mean it's fact. It means that the witch's side either cannot or chooses to not deny it with red truth. Beato let out a cry of anguish at that pain. Ugh, not yet. This is still nothing. Not yet. Not yet. On to the third game. The sixth link closed rooms, the murders of Aunt Rosa and Maria, that and the rest deaths in the hall, the murder of Aunt Krauss and Aunt Nazi. All of that can be explained if we suppose that Aunt Ava was the culprit. This argument was already won back then, and even that final riddle you proposed through Ava, the murder of Dr. Nanjo, can be explained with an 18th unknown person X. That breaks to the whole third game. Can you counter that? Duh. No, of course. This much is nothing to worry about. In that case, how do you explain George's disappearance from the guest house? I shall add to the red truth. George did not go down the stairs of the guest house. He pulled it through the window. That last part wasn't in red. <clears throat> in the final stages of the third game, George suddenly disappeared, vanished from the second floor of the guest house. Ava, who'd been on the first floor, claimed that no one had come downstairs. But, could, but because of the blue truth, George could have snuck down to the first floor and escaped while Ava was busy carrying Krause's and Nazis' corpses outside. But by adding an additional red truth, Beato had denied that possibility. To go outside without going down the staircase to the first floor, he would have had to leave by the window. But all the windows had been locked from the inside. So what? It's just like you said. He caught the window, right? It was a lawn, so he couldn't tell if he jumped down, and it was raining so hard. Any light traces would have disappeared. I'll use the red truth again. All windows and doors leading to the outside were locked from the inside. Furthermore, it is impossible to lock any of those from the outside. George had no technique by which to lock them. It is more the blue. I said it myself at the time. In that case, everything works out as, lo as long as someone locked the window after George Anarchy escaped through it. You yeah, why not? It doesn't have to make sense. It doesn't have to be reasonable. It has to be possible. <clears throat> we're talking possibilities here. Ah, good. Can I not escape after something like this? Battle is a lot stronger now that he doesn't mind accusing family members and saying that they did insane stuff. <coughs> Beato couldn't remove the blue witch that was buried into her foot. The fake witch was burned more and more by that forceful blue. Yeah, that might be possible because it's like he didn't go down the stairs. I didn't check the Japanese there, but yep, that probably makes sense. If it weren't such a, a pain, I'll go back and look at where you always buy it. I've looked back in the log a lot. There's still nothing that shakes my blue truth in any of the first three games. In that case, the only game that can move your witch is this game, the fourth game. Since I haven't countered you with a red, that is so. I shall have to prove witches using only this game. Very well. Give me everything you've got. There's nothing strange about the murder of the six people in the dining hall. The 18th person X went wild with a gun and killed everyone. As for the pitfalls, there's a chance that pet poles truly were hidden there, and it's possible to explain it using Kadea's sense theory, supposing that poison dart shooting device X, which can knock a person out instantly, exists. The murders of George Anarchy, Jessica, and those who escaped from the dungeon can also be explained with guns, just like the dining hall. There's nothing strange about it. I'm sure you've got a counterattack, right? Bring it on. Your greatest sword, this 18th person X, is based on the theory that Kinzo was already dead. I knew you'd make that claim. That's why I took Kinzo out of his study. All members in the family conference welcome that Kinzo, right? All of those present at the family conference acknowledge the presence of Kindo. That's right. The grandfather was seriously ill, bedridden on the verge of life and death, right? He was so worn out that he looked like a different person, maybe no one would have cared, right? I'll gather with this. That grandfather was a different person, a body double. A different person the relatives mistook for grandfather. Then I'll gather with this. No person would mistake Ushima Kinzo by sight. No matter what disguise might be used, they would not mistake Ushima Kinzo by sight. Then I'll use this. In the second game, when you announced with the red suit that there were five master keys, even though there could have been more than five in the first game, you changed the premise of the later games, so it's possible that Kinzo's life or death status was changed for the fourth game alone. 
Therefore, Kinzer's presence in the fourth game doesn't serve as proof that he was present in the previous games. Therefore, even if we suppose that the six murders in the dining hall were carried out by grandfather, it contradicts nothing. Then let me counter this way. Kinzer's life or death status is the same at the start of all four games. The setup was not different for the fourth game alone. Repeat it. Kinza was alive at the start of start time of every game. I refuse to repeat it. I won't answer, Battler. I won't give you the red truth you so desire. Damn, it's standing in my way, geezer. You're putting yourself in the line to protect Beatrice, this most beloved witch of yours. Huang, that damn geezer came into view. Hey, is he trying to be some kind of knight, walking the path between me and Beato? Battler, are you capable of surpassing me? I won't let you reach. I will not let you reach. Out to the Golden Land. The Golden Witch's height, you see. I, I do not have a consistent voice for Kin, so I can't do a good old man voice. I apologize. So. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I've tried to. Try to just do a deep voice. The thoughtless reason it could talk. Cannot surpass even me alone. Die! Kinzo's jet black robe spread as though it would swallow the world, becoming the snout of a vast black dragon that came at me, trying to swallow me in one gulp. Based with that black dragon's roar, I calm my breathing and close my eyes lightly. He actually does become like a big, like, maleficent like dragon in the anime. Cool to see it animated. I'll swallow you up in a single gulp. Disappear, the spirit's fool! Oh, there is CG for it. Nice. Ooh. Wow, that's that's a lot cooler looking than it is in the anime. That's pretty neat, actually. Good dragon, good Dark Souls boss. Meet Goldsmith. Quiet, you damn undying ghost. Oh, so you called me a ghost? So you intend to see it through to the end? This theory that I'm already dead. That will prove fatal to you. Be swallowed up by the first twilight of the fourth game and disappear. Okay, got it. I'll save that one. See you. Thank you. The black dragon's fast mouth, its snout, its fangs, swallowed Battler whole. I mean, Echo Vor. In that instant, Battler suddenly opened his eyes. Thanks, Beatrice. Your third game became a foothold for my counterattack. What? See you, damn geezer. This is goodbye. As a basis for claiming that Kinzo was dead, even in the fourth game, I propose the following theory. Very well. Come with all you have, my descendant. Here I go, you damn geezer. My theory is that the name of Kinzo gets passed on as the title of the Ushima family head. Ushima Kinzo was already dead, and he passed that name on to someone else. Everyone acknowledged that. That way, all of those present at the family conference acknowledged the presence of Kinzo. So they didn't mistake him. They unanimously agreed the person standing in front of them is Kinzo. It's, it's clever wordplay. There wasn't even any need for someone to disguise themselves as grandfather, because everyone acknowledged a new Kinzo, so they didn't actually mistake Kinzo by sight. As long as this theory is not denied, nothing can change the fact that you're dead. This is the final blow. Damn geezer, I demand that you repeat it. Among all the people there, not one had multiple different names. I could not. Gah. Rest in peace, damn geezer. Thank me. You were finally, finally able to die. This is your requiem. Take it and drop dead. Ishmita Kinza was already dead. That's right. You definitely des deserve to be pitied. Since whenever we find your corpse, it's always completely burnt. That was a device to hide the fact that time had passed since your death. Then, you passed that name onto someone else. In this theory, even though you were dead, Kinzo was able to appear at the family conference. How's that? This is Checkmate. I love the Kinzo twist so much. Because uh, you can easily, like... Notice the fact that he's burnt in all the games and I'm gonna start thinking something's weird about it, but it's such like a big leap that I think people wouldn't really be confident in that theory. Yep. Kinzo, dead, dragon, slain. Several dozen blue stakes poured into Kinzo's ghost. The tribal destructive power wouldn't let the ghost recover again. Beto <laughs> Riche. So essentially, let me make it clear. Anytime we've seen we've seen Kinza, anytime another person has seen Kinza, it wasn't real. Uh, essentially, that person lied 
So when Natsu you saw Kinzo in what was it episode two? I can't remember. Maybe even episode one. That was a lie. So I think Ava was the one confronting her, like, oh, this didn't really happen, did it? Natsu defended herself. It was a lie. Didn't happen. Every time we've seen Kinzo talking with a servant in a study, it didn't happen. Or maybe that was someone else with Kinzo's name. It's it's hard to say. That doesn't really matter. But when who killed Kinzo? What? Kinzo, thank you for everything. Rest in peace. No one had to have killed Kinzo. He was just dead before each game. It doesn't matter, does it? I will not forget my time spent with you. Also, he was old. He could have just died. Doesn't have anything to do with solving the game. Dispersing along with the shadow of the Black Dragon, his golden flower petals scattered. Ushimi to Kinzo became a gold-colored cyclone and disappeared. Even after death, he had fought with the sake of the woman he loved. There's no doubting that Joel and Madness were the real thing. Hmm, Battler? Don't hate me. Let the dead sleep. Don't wake them. You're up next. This is the end for you too. Beato still couldn't put up. Pull out the blue wedge that pierced her foot. She realized that she was on the verge of death. I've gone along with you a whole bunch. I think I've more than fulfilled any responsibility I had to play with you. But it's about time to finish things up. I've got a lonely little sister waiting at home. Well, they needed the corpse because they wanted people to think that Kinzo had been alive and was, um, killed during the games. Let me take the leave with my- let me take my leave with my whole family and kill me. In that case, try and kill me. I won't want her hide and by now I won't even be able to avoid it. Come on, you're shooting me to battle her. You've got it. With the 18th person X from the Kinzo was dead theory, Everything that remained has been pierced through. George, Anakin, and Jessica's deaths in the fourth game can also be explained by Culprit X. The five who escaped from the dungeon were killed, and the two in the gardening shed, and Maria in the end. All those can be explained with 18th person X. There's nothing strange there at all. It still doesn't work with the gardening shed, actually. We still have to address that. For this, I fully explained the culprit using humans for all games. Beatrice, this is Checkmate. You gonna eventually fight back, Beatrice? Very good finale, otherwise. Beatrice, who couldn't dodge, had several blue stakes driven into her and was skewered. Beato grabbed at them, trying to pull them out somehow. Ah, uh, that got me. It hurts. This'll kill me, won't it? If I don't pull these out, I'll die. I've had enough of the pain. I've had enough of the anguish. With both hands, Beato firmly grasped one of the blue stakes. Plus, with the lockdown, that was tampered with in advance. Mm. I, I think it's a kind of stupid theory to just say, oh, the lock was broken, or something like that. I don't know about that. But maybe we'll get there. Naturally, the power of the witch denying blue truth burned our hands. Unable even to hide her tears of the pain, we had to howl and try to pull the stakes out with all our might. If I can't pull these out, I'll die. This is my final counterattack. Then Battler. How do you explain my several acts of magic? The very first time those appeared was in the second game when I fixed Mario's pumpkin marshmallow. At that time, Rosa definitely witnessed that magic. Certainly, at that time, Rosa witnessed gold butterflies gathering and the fixing of a marshmallow by the miracle of magic. Come the Kira lock, pick the shutter. Uh, we'll, we'll get there, we'll get there. there. I guess there's a lot of little nitty-gritty details like that that haven't come up, necessarily. Rosa alone witnessing it, it isn't very credible, right? That's why I increased the number of witnesses to the uppermost limit later on. Which is what happened in this last game. The summoning of my minions. My brutal murders due to magic. All those were witnessed by a great many people. That is itself proof that my magic exists. How do you explain that, Ushid Mino Battler? Stalemate. But what? Magic exists because magic exists. Didn't the rules of our brawn tube trials say that you couldn't use that kind of argument? Y yes you're right. <laughs> no matter who or how many people witness magic, that cannot become proof of magic's existence. Whether all the magic you've shown exists or not, I can ignore it all and explain things with humans. That's my undeniable right. Am I wrong? At those words, the blue stakes let out, out an even brighter light knocking my hands away. Seems I can't pull them out after all. As battlers now. Even if I pull up a witness for each individual bit of magic and demand an explanation, I'll probably use some kind of move to deny all of them. 
not just magic with a marshmallow I showed Rosa, but, but all the miracles of magic. So I can no longer even claim to be a witch without questioning him about something like how a marshmallow was fixed. <clears throat> I'm in such an inferior position that I must, must fight over such trivialities. It may be impossible for me. I know that this was to be a game without victory from the very beginning. So it was only natural that the day of my defeat would eventually come. I have fought up until today, just to lose to Battler. I began the game, thinking I might be able to win. Even if I wouldn't be able to win easily, I believe that in a game repeating endlessly, a miracle would eventually occur. After all, I had certain willpower on my side, an unwavering desire to win with certainty. Use the bathroom before we move on, we still have a fair bill on after all. Be right back. We would have to get up during the good parts. Okay. However, I've now lost that miracle completely. And that certain willpower resides in Battler, leaving me certainly without even a one in a million chance at a miracle. Or perhaps I should say, I've been left without a miracle or certainty. I have no victory and no end through a tie. The only resolution allowed me is to continue on resisting until defeat is given to me in this game. <coughs> That's right, I am fighting only to be killed by Battler. I looked into Battler's eyes. That which was reflected in them wasn't me. The figures of the little sister waiting for his return, and the family he had to bring back were reflected in those eyes. To him, my existence is already not even that of an individual, obviously. From the very beginning, he's been trying to deny the individual that I am. Yes, that last game sure was fun. I was only tricking him a bit, but for just a short period of time, it felt like we understood each other, and that was fun. That's right. I should have made my move then. I should have continued for eternity with Battler still totally fooled. But, that's just no good, right? That just wouldn't be true victory. Is this checkmate? Beatrice? Beato had been run through with several blue stakes, skewered over and over again to the ground, <clears throat> while still standing. Because of that, she wasn't even able to fall over, and still looking up into the sky was so in place. That tragic form. Might have been a fitting end for the cruel witch who had endlessly toyed with 18 people's lives, and who had killed constantly for hundreds and thousands of years. Gently, as though someone was mourning over something, rain began to fall. Amid that rain, Beato was soaked and crucified. Is it over, Beato? Can't even let out a squeak. Not yet. You want a woman who will let things end with just this. Don't be ridiculous. How can you look at this and think that it isn't over? Quickly, deliver the final blow. Just say it, with your blue truth. According to this, which is do not exist. Say it. Just say it. That single blow just put a stop to my breathing. It's useless. Oh, so you would expose me to even further shame? Isn't it settled already? Stand up. Our brawl still isn't over. Not over, you say? That just now wasn't you losing. We just stopped and gave up. 
Isn't that enough? Wouldn't giving up mean your victory? You should return to your little sister right away. Just throw me away. Right here. Didn't I tell you? I won't run away. And I won't let you run away. Don't forget, this is halfway through Mineko. There's still a hell of a lot of story left. Just who are you? And what in the world is it that you want? If you want to know, why don't you just try your favorite move? Isn't it better this way? With me as a mere delusion? An illusion? Isn't that enough? It's all useless. I won't let you run away. I'll break through you. How could I let you run away like this? I won't let you run back to the darkness of illusions while you're still all hazy like this. I'll break through you. Completely. So stand up. Don't act all frail like that. You're still hiding several moves. I can tell. Why won't you just let me escape? Dad, Mom, and Angie. All the cousins and all the relatives. And all the servants. You toyed with them so much and killed them. I definitely won't forget. Won't forgive that inhumanity. I can still feel Angie's arms on my shoulders. I won't forgive your inhumanity. So I won't let you get away like this. Eller's eyes burned with the flames of hatred. The time had long since passed during which pitiful behavior would have earned his compassion. After being tricked once, Battler will never sympathize with me again. Instead of the wolves and sheep puzzle, this is like the boy you required wolf, isn't it? What am I supposed to do? What should I do? Is fighting endlessly only to avoid admitting defeat? A fitting endless torture for the endless witch? Is endlessly harassing Battler to avoid giving a victory also part of being the endless witch? <coughs> It's so sad. Is this what the endless magic is? I've had enough. I've had enough of endlessly being toyed with by witches. I will have no victory and no tie. <laughs> In that case, there's only one result that can release me. <laughs> Since the time I succumbed to the path of witches, since the day I made that contract with demons, it was promised that I would meet my end through tragedy, was it not? It's like I uh, used the death note. What's wrong? Golden Witch Beatrice, if you are the ruler of Rakenjima, show me a match as he fitting for that, even at the very end. Lightning. The world was smashed with white. Fitting last moments for the ruler of Rakenjima. Ha ha. Ha ha ha. Still pierced by the blue stakes, Vieta faced the rainy sky and let out a cry of laughter. Then, she slowly raised her face and stared at Batman. Cool. Just when I was about to praise your good fight and hand over victory, you shall regret that pride. This isn't something for you to hand over. I'm gonna take it from you. The same goes for you, right? You could never accept an easygoing victory where I just say, maybe which is existing isn't so bad. Isn't that the very reason you intentionally fell apart like that at the end last time? That's right. Last game, you took pity on me just once, didn't you? So now I'll pay back that debt. Stand, my enemy, my golden witch, Beatrice. My golden witch. Let's see if he says that. He really does. He actually says my golden witch. Ah, The love between them is so strong. <laughs> fool. You fool. You simpleton. You think you'll get another chance? Here we go. Now things are about to be good. When Beato yelled, the blue sticks that had pierced her chest blew to bits and disappeared. However, the blue ones that had pierced her foot in the very beginning did not vanish. You can't pull it out yet. You can't pull the blue truth of the 18th person X. I will respond to one thing you told me to repeat. As you reasoned, Kienzo was already dead at the starting time for all games. However, this means that you can take one person out. Before now, I have proclaimed that no more than 18 humans exist in the island. I will lower that by one for Kinzo. No more than 17 humans exist on this island. That excludes any 18th person. In short, this 18th person X does not exist. This applies to all games. Bowers fucked. What do you know? Looks like you're still hiding some pretty crazy stuff up your sleeve after all. The island, which had no more than 17 humans on it, had been set up to appear as though there were 18. Taking one off makes it 17, so we finally reached the correct number. <clears throat> this way, the wedge I knocked into you has been removed. We'll have to start the fight over back from square one. Yeah, that confrontation before wasn't the real one. We're gonna be here for a while. The blue words that had sewn Beato in place broke apart. There was no longer anything piercing her. The scars on her body disappeared completely. 
There stood, just as Battler had hoped for, a figure with a majestic golden witch who ruled Rakenjima. Then come, Battler. Once more from the beginning. Try and break through everything but the blue truth. I, too, will no longer play, run, or hide. If you're worthless, then I shall end this match right here, right now. With my grand victory, I'll make you regret your refusal to compromise for alternative. Come, starting from the first game. Right. From the first twilight of the first game, there's nothing strange about the murder of the six relatives that were found in the gardening shed at the start. The crime was possible for any of those who didn't have an alibi. Valid. Continue. What about the next closed room murder with Eva and Hideyoshi? Even the chain was set for that closed room. I shall add to the red truth. Both deaths were homicides. It is not the case that, after the construct in the closed room, one of them committed suicide after committing murder. Furthermore, the murder was carried out with both the victim and perpetrator in the same room. No path that exists for the perpetrator to commit murder from outside the room. Suppose that the culprit was a human without an alibi. In other words, the dead. We weren't able to identify some of the first six corpses because of their smashed faces. Maybe one was actually a disguised corpse, and culprit Etz killed those two after making us think they were a victim and hiding away. Then, after the closed room murder was constructed, the culprit hid under the bed and waited for all of us to come and leave. And we checked the bathroom, but not the bed. Very well, next. Cannon was killed in the bullet room, correct? I shall add to the red truth. All the survivors have alibis. Let us include the dead as well. In short, no kind of human or dead person on the island could have killed Cannon. If no one could kill him, then he might have been the one to kill. Cannon could might have killed himself. Repeat it. Cannon could did not commit suicide. Cannon did not commit suicide. One more. Repeat it. Cannon Kun's death was a homicide. I refuse to repeat it. At the refusal, it may be possible to view it as a homicide, but you've already proclaimed in red that no one could have killed him. In other words, it wasn't a homicide. This is the same as the link to close rooms from the third game. Cannon could have died for a reason that it was neither suicide nor homicide. The details are, are unknown, but he died due to an accident. Is the devil's proof? I refuse to explain what kind of blunder could have led to an accidental death where a stake was driven into his chest. Oh, now that you've borrowed the power of demons, you are without peer. It is valid. In that case, what about the murders after that in the parlor of Genji, Nanjo, and Kumasawa? Naturally, Mari, who was in the same room, did not kill them. And of course, their three deaths were homicides. This was uh, when Mari like, called on the phone and was like singing to herself. We can explain those murdered with, with Culper X, who hid away using an unidentified corpse. After all, those three had their faces smashed. It's completely possible that one of them was a body double corpse. I guarantee they identified the identities of all unidentified corpses. Therefore, there were no body double tricks. Then you can explain it with simultaneous murders. Each of them had a gun, pointed it clockwise, and blew each other's faces off at the same time. After that, Mario collected those guns and hid them. How about that? <laughs> what? What a ridiculous argument. <laughs> How amusing. Then what about Natsuhi in the end? She's not denying it. <laughs> like, fine, okay, you made up some bullshit. Let's move on. I shall add to the red truth. Natsuhi's death was a homicide. There were no unidentified corpses, and all the survivors have alibis. You can explain it with an indirect murder due to Trap X. Something was done to Natsuhi's gun. It could have been a trap gun, built to send a bullet right into the forehead of anyone who tried to hold it up and shoot it. The bullet buried in Natsuhi's forehead was not fired from her gun. It's possible that Aunt Natsuhi was lured out with that litter, whose contents were unknown. She was called out into the hall. Then, she was forced to stand at a specified location, at a specified time, and murdered by Trap X, which used a gun that had been installed there beforehand. Wonderful. Though these reckless arguments of yours are even starting to feel pleasurable now. Out of respect, I shall hand the first game over to you. Well done. We made up enough stupid nonsense that she's willing to move on. The instant Bea to acknowledge her defeat in the first game, the stakes of the blue truth once again pierced her chest, letting in a terrible sound. Now remind her, stuff here isn't necessarily true. Um, she just cannot or refuses to use red truth to deny it. Maybe that's because she's hiding something else. I mean, she, she's hidden the whole Kinzo thing this whole time by sometimes refusing to repeat things, refusing to answer. It is indeed just a theory. <sighs> this is still hardly painful, and it's not over yet. Come, now for the second game. Beato just barely pulled out the stakes that had pierced her chest, but even though there was no hole left behind, she still seemed to be bearing a deep wound that was letting out a massive amount of blood, and she was tormented by an equally fierce pain. Obeto grinned, grinding her teeth, and pushed for the next game to start. But I won't feel sympathy for her. 
Just by her existing there, we've been killed and harassed over and over. And Angie's been burdened with the future of isolation. Correct. Just by me, just by my being here and laughing, this eternal hell will continue. I won't give your old sister back. Let her cry over the family that shall not return for the next thousand years. Damn it. No compassion, no mercy. On to the second game. I'll start with the first crime. Right after it happened, I penetrated to the truth of the closed room murder where the six were killed in the chapel. Someone secretly borrowed Mario's key or secretly turned it to Mario's bag after the crime was over. From the time Mario received the key to the instant Rose unsealed the envelope the next day, the key passed through no one's hands. The door might have had an auto lock, just like Gramps' study. In other words, it was unlocked before the crime, with a rock or something wedged in instead of cl 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 closed completely. Then someone gave the key to Mario. The lock was automatic, so it's possible to make a theory where the key wasn't needed. There were no doors with auto locks other than Kinzo's study. The victims locked the door from the inside. One of the six was the culprit, and this person killed the other five and pretended to be dead. The six were already dead by the time they were discovered. All their deaths were homicides. All six were genuine victims and did not take part in a mutual murder. There was no simultaneous murder. There were people, could be saw a sign in particular, who had no alibi at the time. If we assume that someone's hiding on the inside, then we've got no problems. There was no one hiding in the chapel. Therefore, the shot and murder you suggested does not work. What's wrong? Is that all we should need about it? It's not so easy once you get to the second game, right? It was a thundering exchange of red and blue truth. The stakes and wedges of blue truth that I sent flying attacked one after the other and Beato cut them down, one after another with her red truth, her red treasured sword knocking them down. Yeah, here it comes. Matt Pat's big theory. But the blood's but the blood she lost from the first game is probably serious. This intense exercise was putting an even greater strain on her. I could also see her breath growing ragged. That's why I can't hold back now. I'll corner that witch. This time I'll break through her. Not yet. Ah, uh, it's useless. It's all useless. My Swiss to the logic isn't finished yet. Then what about this? The food they were given had small bombs in it, which exploded from inside their stomachs. In other words, the crime was possible through Trap X. The exact nature of bombs they could swallow without noticing and which could also blow open their stomachs as a devil's proof. I refuse to explain. <laughs> what the hell's that? Small bombs? But Beato failed to knock down the blue wedge as it flew an angle like a breaking pitch. Can't fight the small bomb theory. Been waiting four episodes for this. It let a loud thunk and gouge itself deep into her left shoulder. However, even as the breaking pitch hit her, her laughter didn't seem to be stopping. Yeah, I get it. Even I think that theory is pretty screwed up. Yeah, laugh as much as you want. Got a problem with that? None. What a pleasurable, reckless argument. Well, maybe she doesn't want to. I, I'm i not sure why offhand. I, I don't remember what the canon explanation for the murder is. We'll get into more detail someday. Next up is the closed room with Jessica and Cannon. No problems there. If the culprit was one of the servants, they could have used a master key. It's not even a closed room. After that, there was an attack in the server room for a mystery person who seemed to be Cannon. And Najo and Kumasawa were killed, right? I'd already proclaimed Cannon's death in red before that time. So who was that Cannon? If Cannon Code's death was proclaimed with the red, there's no way he was alive. Therefore, there's a chance that the one who attacked their group was in a disguise that made everyone mistakenly think it was Cannon Code. They would never mistakenly think other any other person was Cannon. Then, just like the heredity of Kinzo's name, there's a possibility that Cannon's name was inherited by someone. You could suppose that Cannon Code was killed, a different person succeeded that name, and then this person attacked them. Basically, if everyone agrees that it was canon, it's canon. Hehehehe. <laughs> a sound like a watermelon being squashed rang out, and a blue wedge was buried deep in the Beato's left flank. Maybe it hit in a bad place, since it seemed to be really effective. After leaning over and moaning for a while, she laughed it off as though trying to make it seem like no big deal. Yeah, I get it. That must have hurt a lot. Yeah. Once again, you've set up some human as the culprit as if it were nothing. You truly are gabbing on about things you'd never be able to open your mouth and say on the game board. And yet it's valid. That reckless argument is pleasurable. Truly pleasurable. This isn't pain, it's pleasure. When Beato howled, the wedge that had pierced her was blasted away. But the wound remained, and she continued to be tormented by a fierce pain. You ready? I'll keep going. I blew truth for the last murder in the second game. 
The three who died in Na Natsui's room should still be valid even with the 18th person X denied. Do you have a counter argument for that in red? If you don't, the second game is all mine too. No, I don't. Running over such trivial matters bores me. I'll give it to you. I'll give you the second game. Wah. Oof. The instant she acknowledged her loss in the second game, two blue stakes gouged through Beato's chest this time. The witch's lungs were gouged, as were her intestines. Her face twisted in anguish. Her body twisted as she gasped in pain. Does it hurt? Hurt? No, no, this just tickles. At least compared to having your entire body torn to bits and turned into a pile of scrap meat, like your sister! I'll make you scrap meat too. Then you siblings can all be mixed together like ground beef and pork. <laughs> I'll beat you to death. I'll tear you to bits the same way. Next, the third game. How long are you going to sit around all worn out like that? I've only just started knocking you down to hell. Naturally, as if something like this could wear me down. You're right. We're still just getting started. Come, let us begin the third game, starting with a set's linked closed rooms. You supposedly did penetrate this closed room at the time, but then you killed off Kinzo. At the time, I theorized that Gramps was the culprit. That after killing the other five and stringing the keys across each room, he'd constructed his own closed room in the boiler room. That there, he died in an accident while carrying out some kind of scheme, burning to the death in the boiler. But now I've declared that Gramps was already dead. So I've denied my own theory myself, ironically enough. However, <clears throat> there's no problem. Plenty of people besides Gramps could have committed the crime. You could even claim that all the adults holding the family conference were in on it. All five master keys were discovered, each in the pocket of one of the servants. The individual room keys were found inside envelopes alongside the corpses. In short, all keys related to the linked closed rooms were inside the linked closed rooms. No key could have been returned from outside the, the room using the crack of the door, the crack of the window, events, or any place of the sort. Then they were killed with poison gas. Even if a key couldn't pass through, gas could, right? The murder was carried out from outside the closed room. All of them had what appeared to be gunshot wounds that were fatal. Appeared to be. Appeared to be. Murdering them from outside the room would have been impossible. I shall say more with the red. When the five other than Kinzo were killed, the killer was definitely in the same room as them. I already proclaimed in red at the same... Red at the time that there were no suicides. After the murder of each person in their respective rooms, the culprit created a linked closed room. But the culprit had no way to return just the key to the very last room. And yet, they were able to do it. After all, the first person to discover a corpse just had to pretend to find the key and pull it from the pocket of one of the corpses. So essentially, it wasn't a closed room link to begin with. Whoever walked in just pretended to find the key. Whoever checked the corpse, I guess. Good trick. She couldn't fully block the retort of that blue steak. The other was pushed back with the blue wedges that were unleashed on her one after another. Finally failed to block one, and once again, took a severe wound. As she howled in pain, she pulled out the blue wedge that had pierced her red arm. Yeah. Yep. I know what you mean. What do you mean, like, not a new mean echo? That would be an interesting read, yeah. Would have that kind of knowledge. Beto's entire body had been torn apart and pierced with blue wedges, stakes, and blades over and over again, and now she was totally covered in blood. But even so, Beto grinned, cackling as though this was amusing. How could a man who promised to bring Angie's parents home voice the theory where those parents are culprits? Splendid, even that's just fine, right? Go be a big, happily family, getting their heads, their hands dirty with mass murder, then return to Angie stained with blood that will never come off. How could we expect anything less from the people who returned alive from the Witch's Island? Just what that mincemeat Angie needs. Ah, uh, shut up. I'll kill you. I'll tear you apart. No need to waste your time begging for your life. I'll definitely give you the worst kind of death by my own hands. Yes, you probably could do it. I've been spoiled the deaths of cruelty for over a thousand years. You probably will give, gift me with a fitting end for all that. Oh, does that hurt? Is it harsh? What does it tickle? Is that supposed to torment me? Come on, Ushid Moon Battler. There are still mysteries left. Beato had already count counted my first powerful move, the 18th person X. Made making the number of people the number of people on the island 17. Just limiting the number of people to 17 didn't overturn the theory that Ante was the culprit. I can crush most of the murders in the third game this way. Blood dripped from all over the body of the Golden Witch. I cornered her, this time thoroughly without mercy. No, sweetie. This isn't a game played to decide who wins and who loses. Yeah, we aren't playing. Even though, even the time I stopped. 
slow down. Even the time I spend playing and fighting like this delays my trip home. In her isolation, Angie will continue to have her heart torn apart by loneliness and sadness. I have to go back to Angie as fast as I can. Yeah, I, I think he mostly solved it. You're all worn out. Standing at death's door, are you? Poor Beato. It still doesn't burden me. Something like this. It tickles. It looks like you don't need any mercy. I never asked for it in the first place. I'm going all out. Do so. When our roles are reversed, I showed no mercy. So you ought to do the same when given the chance. Otherwise, I'll summon another isolated Angie from a different world. And this time, I'll tear off her arms and legs. Stick with the spear and roast her, okay? Shut up. Never again. Not my family. Not my relatives. Not any of the servants. I won't let you make them your playthings. I've already broken through all the mysteries in the fourth game with the blue truth. The only one left is the very last one from the third game. Only the murder of Dr. Nanjo. Oh ho. Have I already been cornered so far? What a precarious state I'm in. Hehe. <laughs> She coughed violently, spitting up blood. Her insides have been punched through so many times. It was only natural. In other words, the mystery of Dr. Nando's murder is the last one of defense for you being a witch, right? As you say, if you defeat that, it will mean that all my mysteries have been defeated. Unless I counter one of your truths with some new real truth, or present a new mystery, I will die. You don't look like someone who's been pushed in a corner, standing on the brink. You still have some kind of hidden pitch up your sleeve, right? Well, who knows? I've already tired of a too long, of a too long life after a thousand years. I have started to think that having this life ended by a rival like you, when I stumbled upon at the very end, might not be so bad. You can do it, can't you? Do it. I beg you, kill me. I'm always the one killing. I've never had the experience of being killed. I've killed the ATW hundreds of times, but I haven't been killed myself even once. So I wanted to experience it just once myself. It was a graceful show of boldness, unchanged from before, but blood dripped from her mouth. Her once beautiful dress was covered with holes, and blood poured from all over her body, making her physical appearance stand in sharp contrast to her attitude. Maybe the shot she'd taken to the flank was still tormenting her, since she was still pressing down on it unconsciously without a trace of grace. But I've got no time for pity. As long as I feel sympathy for this witch, my family and I won't be released from this place. Until we defeat her, we won't be able to go home. In the outside world, it may be possible for even enemies to understand each other when circumstances change. But pure evil does exist. Evil that brings misfortune just by existing. Dan is to be spared no compromise. Just by its continued ex existence alone, it's evil. I don't pity you. Just like how you didn't show pity for any of us. Well, of course. All of you are just pieces in the game. It's just unbelievably fun to think about which six to kill in the beginning, how to kill the next two, and whether I can find a much, much more grotesque method of murder, you see. Hey, Battler, I've reformed a little, so forgive me this time, too. If you do, I'll change my methods of killing into something a little better, okay? I'll listen to how you want it to be killed in what order, got it? It's so fun telling with people's lives. I'm sure you could think of a new way to turn Angie into a pile of scrap meat much, much more thoroughly. Gun battler, try to expose the truth of Nanjo's murder. The 18th person X has been defeated, but I won't give in. I'll stop that witch's breathing cold. The end of the third game. It was announced in red that the survivors at that time, Battler, Ava, Jessica, and Nanjo, were all involved with Nanjo's murder. It was also proclaimed that he was murdered directly by someone before his eyes. All other people have the strongest possible alibi by having their deaths proclaimed in red. I'll break through this without using the 18th person X. Think. Don't stop thinking. Red doesn't only bind me. It's also supposed to be her weak point. I've got to somehow use it against her. That's right. There's still a gap. Yeah, this way I can break through it. This way, Beatrice's Legend of the Witch is finished. True, the others probably were dead. However, their deaths were not proclaimed in red at the instant Dr. Nanjo died. Strictly speaking, it was in the fight between me and Ava after Dr. Nanjo's, after Dr. Nanjo's corpse was found. In other words, if someone was alive at the time Dr. Nanjo was killed, and then died before Ava made that proclamation, you would sew right through that crack. In other words, it's like this. Someone who was first confirmed dead by Ava's proclamation was a culprit. They cleverly played dead earlier and waited for us to come and go. Before their death was announced in red, we were made to think that they died. Then, they killed Dr. Nanjo and later died for some reason. After that, Ava proclaimed their, their death in red. That theory can explain Dr. Nanjo's case. How's that, Beatrice? Ooh. When you forcefully asked that question, there was a terrible sound that could only be likened to that of a compressor, and a blue stake that was as thick as a log. 
appeared from underneath the earth and skewered the Golden Witch Pieta, pulling her up into the air. Ugly tearing sounds rang out, and each time, a loose staker wedge would appear in Pia Beatrice's body. When that finally ended, her gigantic form was exposed there, being cushioned by more than ten stakes and wedges all over her body, and dripping with blood, dangling and crucified. Has he done it? There was none of the dignity of the brutal witch. There was none of the dignity of the brutal witch who had sneered at the honor of the dead and toyed with and killed hundreds of the living, probably thousands too. The rain, which had started falling at some point, quietly tormented the crucified witch. Yeah, I was wondering if there'd be one for that. Really nice, actually. Good art. This is what we're looking at right now. The Edo ain't looking so good. As Battler heaved with his breathing, he waited for some kind of answer from the Golden Witch. Although it wasn't long, it took the witch a bit of time to show any signs of life. It hurts. It hurts. You got what you deserved. Now you can experience a portion of the pain felt by all those you've killed. Even as he said that, it seemed Battler had lost a little of his momentum at this extremely pathetic sight. Even if it was an enemy, he couldn't look straight at a woman exposed in such a brutal fashion. But even so, unless he destroyed Beatrice, this battle wouldn't end. Battler, I beg you. Huh? Beta let out a sob. It hurts. It really hurts. End it. End it. Even with this, I still can't die. Even though it hurts so much, I still can't die. What are you asking of me? End it. Release me from this pain. Beato's expression was soaked with blood and tears. Bauer certainly had been tricked by her at one point. So, he was probably able to suspect that her expression, that even her tears, were an act. However, Battler believed in those tears. After all those tears, I had the red of truth mixed in with them. What should I do? What can I do to end your pain? I will now expose everything. This is... My heart. Your heart. Kill me. Beato. Kill me. Just... Let me die. Were those tears from pain and torment? Or else? Either way, that pathetic expression was painful for Battler to look at, even after burning with such anger. Quickly, go back to Angie. I'll listen to your request. Not so that I can go back, but to end your pain. Thank you, Battler. In her last breath, Beato summoned up all of her remaining strength, and managed to close both of her hands into fists. A red light began to gather at those fists. Then, she lifted her arms, as though appealing to the heavens for something. You'll be able to kill me. All of me. My heart. Crush it. Pierce it. Okay? The red light around both her arms gradually began to strengthen. Complete. After saying that much, her face tilted to the side a bit. Then, her red arm lost its light and flopped down. But her left arm alone did not lose its light, and remained held out towards the heavens. Then, before Battler's eyes, another Beato appeared with a faint form, transparent like a curtain. The crucified Beato had already lost consciousness. However, the newly appeared faint Beato quietly looked at me, her eyes expressionless, and spoke. Issue me to Battler. I will now kill you. And? And right now, there is no one other than you on this island. The only one alive on this island is you. Nothing outside of the island can interfere. I understand. This is the last mystery Beatrice will be able to make as a witch. She's trying to offer it to me, entreating me to solve this final mystery and kill her. Do it. I'll accept your final mystery. You are all alone in this island, and of course, I am not you. Yet I am here, now, and I'm about to kill you. Like a souped-up version of Dr. Nanjo's murder. So? Who am I? Is that your final question? Who am I? Then Beatrice slowly approached me, and still expressionless, held me. Yeah, I get it, Beato. I'll kill you, don't worry. I also slowly held her head. Then I, as a piece, left the game board. Just a little bit more left, but... We still don't know who Beatrice really is. Or how. 
that was theoretical death of war. Let's just watch this, enjoy some of the music for a bit. Oh nice, there's actually art for that. Thank you, I'll take that too. So a little piece of CG here. Beautiful. This is Discode, okay. I wonder if that's spelled like Discode on purpose instead of Discord. And this could be like a disassembling a code, like a mystery. It's probably just clever naming, but with a weird uh, English twist. There's a there, there's a better song coming up <clears throat> at the end of the the other key party, I believe. I'm pretty sure that's where um what I'm thinking comes up. This one's fine. I never bother listening to it outside of the game though. This song doesn't have vocals. Uh, I think it does, doesn't it? I think it has vocals. Unless maybe the in-game version doesn't and just the out-of-game one does? Because I know there are some songs like that. Like the version of Golden Nocturne that plays in Episode 7 um, has no vocals, but there's a vocal version. The same thing for uh, Birth of New Witch, I think. I think both of those might play. I forget. Personally, with those, I prefer the non-vocal versions. The vocals are fine, don't get me wrong, but I really like the instrumental lead more than the vocals. Yeah, I, I think that's probably the case that we made for a CD. <clears throat> They're good. The fighting games, I have no clue. I, I don't know. I've heard them, though. Okay, I think it's gonna unlock the witch's tea party. Yes. Okay. Just this left now. Look at that ugly ass pachinko icon and that that achievement. I don't want that. I'm gonna erase that achievement. I don't want it. Pachinko what's terrible. <clears throat> Alright, let's finish this. I don't think there's too much in this tea party. I could be wrong. I think it's pretty short. I I only remember. Oh god. I actually don't remember anything from it except the ending song. A lot of fragments. Scattered in a large bed were cute jelly beans of various colors. Well, that's weird, real, because the thing is, it doesn't unlock the next episode until you watch them. Unless you, like, forcefully go and unlock it before you're supposed to by hitting, like, the unlock button. So, people like that are very confused, I guess. And should not be doing that. It's got an enlarged bed or cute jelly beans of various colors and chocolates shaped like all Hajiki pieces. Oh, the CG? Okay. I'll show it in a minute when it comes up. Hi. <clears throat> a fork was stuck into a shortcake peeking, peeking out of a gift box. And there were decanters with drinks of various colors lined up on a side table. But the color of the partially finished trick that had been poured into a cup was venomous, matching none of the decanters. Someone had probably been playing around, mixing various things together. That can be lots of fun if you don't mind the taste. I tried to make like potions with shampoo as a kid. I didn't drink them, of course, but... <laughs> on top of the fluffy bed were several colorful big pills like something from a dream. And in this bed that looked like something out of a child's dream world, Bryn Castell lay face down, and Lambda Delta lay face up, clutching a pillow and relaxing. Oh, look. CG. Bryn Castell looks miserable as always. Uh, it was pretty thrilling this time, wasn't it? I got really panicky when Beato said she'd stop the game. What a rude witch to start a game like this and try to end it by throwing it away. Wasn't Angie a good piece? After Beato ran for it, Angie dragged her back and made her resume the game. Although it's a shame that she gave Battler a little too much enthusiasm. After all, I knew Battler was a softie. No kidding. You looked like you might even go easy on Beato, his enemy. I was an easy that, like the last game. He might actually feel compassion for Beato and take the game in a weird direction. Angie was a trump card to get Battler back on track when he mistook his goal. Although I wanted her to support him a bit more before using her up. She really did get used right off the bat. 
What a waste for a piece that required so much preparation. <laughs> Good thing I shackled her with that rule about not giving her name. If that hadn't been set up, the brother-sister tag team would have swallowed Vieto up in one at the blink of an eye. I thought it'd be a chance for them to press all, press her all at once, but your mark was so restrictive that I couldn't make the best use of her. Ah, uh, what a waste that piece was. Isn't it obvious that such an unfair piece would have, would have to be retired right away? Well, in the end, she did a good job of preventing the suspension of the game, and that lets me out too. The way she made both her interests match is what made her a truly wonderful piece. She was an innocent kid like Battler, so it was easy to get her to do as I said. Morons and impulsive tights make the best pieces. Ah, uh, I really can't stand losing that piece. By now, that kid's minced meat. Hey, let's make hamburgers out of her later on. Oh wait, didn't you like Yosa more? I wonder what little sister tastes like. Hilarious. Is it really okay for you to be so relaxed? Thanks to Angie, Battler has gotten all fired up. I'm pretty sure he's still a hot pursuit of Beato, making this game take a big turn in my favor, right? I mean, didn't Battler just solve almost all the mysteries up until now? Huh? Not even close. Almost all of Battler's blue chip was wrong. Beato's lukewarm red is full of holes. If she had any brains in her, she'd slip through it easily by setting the pseudo web, web of twisted logic. Yeah, it really ticks me off. If it were me, I'd barely cut it all down with a red. Oh, really? And I was sure that those were all correct. Well, I don't know about that small bomb part, though. <laughs> Not all Bellmer's booze shoots were valid. When talking about the first game, we had so clearly declared that she guaranteed the, ad the identities of all unidentified corpses. This defeats Bellmer's theory about the culprit of the Eva Hideyoshi Coaster murder being someone who faked up a corpse. Next, Kevin might have died in an accident in the Blizzard Room, but what kind of accident could drive a stake into his chest? Are you a moron? I'll slice it with that red treasured sword thing. Kenna did not die in an accident. For the next one, the murders were three, including Genji in the parlor. They thought it was a simul- Oh, he, he thought it was a simultaneous murder where they thought- Where they shot each other in a clockwise pattern at the same time it's laughable. Genji, Kumiso, and Nanjo are not killers. The final trap acts to kill Nazi was also ridiculous. The thing that shot Nazi wasn't a trap. It was a real shooting murder with a, with a gun raised and trigger pulled. Sucks for you. You shouldn't do that. Saying something like that in red. Beck is trying to say that she bounced Nancy's bullet back with magic and killed her. Oh, oh my, how terrible of me. You're right. Even the blue truth of the second game was too naive. When the six were murdered in the chapel, the culprit was inside the chapel. That guy keeps trying to explain things using Trap X. What the heck is Trap X? Some weird mystery novel cliche? It's also laughable to say that, in the case where Nando and Kubisawa were killed in server rooms, someone else inherited Kenneth's name. There's a beast amount of red truths. When you... I said one doesn't have any red truths. What are you talking about? Are you talking about red truths involving it? I uh, maybe. That back back potentially be true then. But that's gonna total up like everything all it, so it's probably right. No one else can go by Ken's name. A different person can't claim that as their as their name. Yeah, retroactively, that's what I thought. That theory about how borrowing the Master Key from Rosa Bernatsu's room is also worthless. After the Master Keys came into Rosa's control, never did any of them leave her hands. Except for the time when she went to Battler to unlock Natsu's room. I can keep on going, but just taking a quick look at them turns out like this. Get it? Quick at taking a quick look. You've just denied Battler's blue truth for the first and second games across the board. My my, what a shame. If that were hurt, he'd faint. Right? Vieta wasn't courted at all. It's like that kid's a pretty good actress after all. I'm sure she planned to make it look like she was getting corn in this game. And then sometime next game, bang, she'll slice it up with a single red story to make Battler freak. And then I'm sure she'll say it again with a huge smile, which is never getting to a pinch. And that whole tragic atmosphere as though Beato was getting cornered was all an act? Isn't it obvious? She really is a great actress. Even though she wasn't courted at all, it felt like an astonishing last episode climax. She's totally the winner for Best Supporting Actress this year. Oh, but of course I'm the star. You do fine too, Baron. At the end, she said something like, Kill me, and laid out a big riddle. Wasn't better last stand for the Beato to be finished for good if that riddle was solved? Come on, were you seriously tricked too, Baron? That wasn't even close to a last stand. Beato's still holding back a killer hidden move. When she stuck at both hands to give the final riddle, did you notice how she lowered just her right hand? Yeah, now that you mention it. Is that what that meant? Sure is. That kid still had plenty of hidden moves left. And none of the mysteries have been solved. That tension, like she'd been exposed in the next episode would be the last. She truly is a genius at acting. Yeah, I want to see her knock Battler down to the very bottom right away. 
That kid's been totally encouraged by her north wind and the sun strategy from last time, right? I'm sure Battler will sympathize with Beato again and fall for it completely. After all, a single tear from a woman can fool a man, totally economical and profitable. I wonder if Battler will get caught by the same move again. I've got to spur him on so he never feels sympathy again. Although, Angie's mincemeat seems to have done that pretty well. A power-up from an Angie-flavored hamburger? Oh, of course, I won't lose either. Starting here, I'll thoroughly support Beato to rally her up enough to compete with Battler. Beato won't lose. I mean, I'm threatening her with a wonderful punishment game if she loses. Your punishment games are seriously not cool, so you should go a little easy on her. I haven't decided what to do for your next punishment game, Burn. Wanna hear? Wanna hear? No. Come on, ask me. Guess what? Guess what? I'll walk you in a wonderful, wonderful castle. That castle will be surrounded by pure white castle walls 12 kilometers to a side, with a height of 10 meters. Magic and tricks are prohibited. You really couldn't jump over that, right? One billion four hundred forty-four million cubic meters. You can stop there. I already know what you're going to say. Yeah, <laughs> and that place will start getting buried with gems. One every day. I'll lock you until it. I'll lock you in until the castle walls are packed with them, and you've been buried to death with gems. Isn't that a wonderful romantic punishment game? If you multiply the length of the walls by five, and make it one tenth its current height, I wouldn't mind if you shut me in it right now. Really? That'd make it. It, 3 billion 600 million cubic meters, right? The time for the punishment game would more than double, right? Uh, I get to keep you as my prisoner for such a long time. I really like you, Bren. I love you. Lambda Delta playfully approached Bren Kistel, who yawned, looking bored, as she touched the bottom of Lambda Delta's chin as though cuddling a cat. You're betting on Battler's victory, and I'm betting on an eternal time for the two of them. Does that mean no one's betting on Beato's victory? I wouldn't. Our chances of winning are zero. Oh, actually pitiful, pitiful, being told by the Witch of Miracles that there's no chance of a miracle. Oh, though I wouldn't bet on her either, right? A billion and 40 million, I don't know, who cares. Numbers, are numbers. I can say that with certainty. Uh, no, there, there wasn't another four there. I see, see, look, there, there's only two fours, there's not three. You are reading it wrong. It's also pretty sad when the Witch of Certainty says that you're certainly screwed. Unusually for them. I said 444. Four, four. Oh. Oh, I read it wrong. Okay. Oops. Well, whatever. Unusually for them, they giggled together. I wonder how this game will resolve itself. 444. Oh, I see. Yeah, I'm at 1 bill, one billion four hundred and forty. Yeah, that's the one thing we can't predict. That's why it's fun. I won't permit escaping or suspensions any longer. I'll certainly make them continue the game, and I won't let them run away. Even though I can't even imagine what'll happen next, I know it certainly won't end that way. At the very least, it won't end with Beato's victory. I mean, think about it. Neither of us is betting on Beato's victory. In other words, if it looks like Beato's gonna win, she'll have us two create witches as enemies. Exactly. Our powers are most in equilibrium when balancing between a tie and battler's advantage. If it tips too much in Beato's favor, both of us will line up along the same vector and drag Beato back. In other words, the instant Beato's in a superior position, she'll have to deal with both of us as enemies. <laughs> a common front with Burn sounds fun. Thanks, but I'm not going into a confetto candy bath with you. Oh, and I was going to cover you with melted marshmallows while taking confetto shower. How pitiful. Stop looking at me. That child is a living toy. A doll you caught so that you could play with me, Lambda. I'm good at playing with dolls. I really can do it well, okay? I'm proud of being able to play with a single toy for hundreds of years without getting tired of it. Your ally and sometimes would oppose her at others toying with her for alternity. How pitiful. That kid is now her doll. Assuming Burns reading all that, it's kinda hard to tell sometimes. Yeah, that's right. That kid is our doll. No one has been prepared for that kid except the ones the two of us desire. In other words, I can say for sure that this can only end by repeating a tie for eternity because of me. I also the Beata losing and being destroyed because of you, Burn. Yeah, as far as this game ending with Beata's victory goes, I'll proclaim it as the Witch of Miracles. Then I will prick. Proclaim it as the Witch of Certainty. Beato certainly cannot win, and a miracle certainly will not occur. But you didn't say it in red. You didn't say it in red. Why didn't they translate the staff screen? What are they doing? They do not want us to know people's names and roles. That's silly. Come on. <laughs> I don't. That's not even really CG, isn't that just portraits? But sure, we'll, we'll show it just so you can see. How horrifying. 
But yeah, sometimes Burn can still even show his uh, emotion. I mean, Aku no Naku Koroni, when the sea cats cry, uh, Shikata Akiko is the, the singer of the, the opening song. We haven't heard her in a while. Rabbit Hole Studio. Oh no. <laughs> you surely would have. Oh, oh, you can speed this up. Oh wait, no. Oh, it's because I cleared the window for a second. Weird. I don't know what that was about. I was speeding up for a bit. I know. Maybe it tries to sync with the song. When the seagulls cry. Yeah. I can, uh, I can grab it, I suppose. Hey, they got some credits. New features. There should be something more now. Music box. I guess the song I'm thinking of must play it like, um... Um, maybe... Maybe it's episode 5. Wait, no, no. Okay. I don't know what that was about. Okay, see so it like shows stuff happening. What? Oh, okay, weird. They have stuff like this prepared. Uh. No, uh, I'm not thinking of Ricordando Il Pesato. I think it's uh, Tsubasa, right? It's a, it's like kind of a rock vocal song, female vocals. I thought it was at the end of four, but I guess not. And it's chapter three. Oh, so it's already played. I'm dumb then. But yes, we'll, we'll play the opening again as requested then. Weird. Hey, I, I, I guess. I mean, I associated it with Angie, so I guess it already played. You're right. And like I said before, I mixed up a lot of stuff between episodes 3 and 4. I kept thinking that Gap appeared in 3. They're vastly different, so I don't really know why I forgot. It's just been a while. I used to know the lyrics to this, but I don't know them right now without them in front of me. So no karaoke. Nasty single out in the opening? Uh, is she? I didn't even notice if so. Uh, let's see. I didn't even translate most of these names. What are they doing? Let's see. Where is Tsubasa? Ah, oh, here it is. Yep. That's not the song. This isn't the song I thought it was at all. No, it's not Tsubasa then, it's something else. What's what, what's the NG song I'm thinking of called, Real? You know? I thought it was Tsubasa, but I guess not. I, I have no idea, actually. Hmm. Skip scary tunes. Play scary tunes only. Active active pain? <clears throat> no, no way. No, it's... I swear it plays, like, during the credits or something. Active pain. Uh, I don't see active pain. Unless I'm supposed to be looking Japanese. Look, it's a peton. Wonderful. Uh... 
Um. Oh, here's activate. No, it's not this. It's not the song. It must come up in a later one. I must have just been confused. Okay, alright. I'm ending there, though. <laughs>